Why don't we say amen? Say amen again. Amen. We thank God for his comforting presence. I thank him for how he always knows what needs to be said. He knows what needs to be sung. He knows what needs to be prayed. He's a providential God, and I'm so grateful for it. Amen. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, in the fourth chapter, I want to continue in our discussion, trust the process. I was glad to hear Shannon give me that shout out, uh, but the, the, the journey and these series of sermons have definitely been challenging and blessing me as well. Uh, this is going to be Second Kings, so that's a mistake on the slides. It's Second Kings, Second Kings rather than First Kings, but Second Kings, chapter number four. And as I've been thinking about this journey, this is a journey. Don't let anybody tell you that the Christian life is a life of instantaneous gratification. Don't let anyone tell you that the Christian life guarantees you a life of comfort and success. If anything, it is the opposite. The Christian life will afford you challenge and hardship, but it will also afford you lifelong reward. However, it is a process. There is a cost. I want to, to look at another matter in the process, and we're going to look here in the life of a widow who's out down to her very last on the verge of death. Beginning with verse number one, it says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditors, his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me. What do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled... Put it to one side. She left him and afterward shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. She kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. I want to talk for a few minutes from the thought, living with limitations. Living with limitations. He stood or stands six feet tall. He's a lean 220 pounds. He's from St. Petersburg, Florida. And he electrified scouts and agents at this year's 2018 Scouting NFL Combine. His name is Shaquem Griffin. And he is the first one-handed player to ever be drafted by the NFL. He would bench press 225 pounds 20 times with one hand. He would run the 40-yard dash in 4.38 seconds with one hand. And I tell you all of this to say that he definitely had a limitation. One hand. Ludwig von Beethoven would compose some of the world's greatest music ever to be heard by humanity 
and some of his music composed while he was deaf. He lost all of his hearing by the time he had reached 33 years of age, but was still composing music afterwards. Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder have blessed our lives and the world several times over with their music, yet both, one was and one still is, blind musicians. I say all that to say that we live in a world surrounded by limitations. And yet, as we talk about trusting the process, as we go through God's process of development, we cannot help but notice our own limitations. We realize that God is trying to make us into something better. And God desires greater for all of us. We all appreciate life as a journey and know that God wants to take us to places we've never been, to expose us to what we've never seen, and to do with us what we never would have imagined. And he does all of that, and we still say, though, but I can't for whatever reason. I'm sure Griffin thought I could never. There were times he felt like maybe only having one hand would put me at a gross disadvantage. I'm sure Beethoven thought that, you know, I cannot hear. I'm not sure if this music will make any sense. And now you're thinking about your own limitations, and perhaps maybe there have been seasons where you said, you know what, I just can't. I won't. I will. It can't happen. It won't be for me. And as we go through the process, you need to understand that limitations ought not be your liabilities. Or better yet, limitations cannot be convenient and legitimate excuses for us not to go, for us not to excel, for us not to exceed, for us not to even try. In the text here, there's a widow, and she's down to her very last, and the creditors are coming to take her sons and put them into indentured servitude. To work off her late husband's debt, she's going to lose her family because of her debts and she doesn't have anything in her home and yet the man of God the prophet comes and engages her in conversation and they start with just that what's in your home but we end with how God moves in the circumstance I come to tell you now that in the process the process is not just about me and you more importantly, the process is about what God does through us in the process. The process is started by God and it is sustained by God. We live under the sovereign will of God, which means that God can do whatever he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, and for whatever reason pleases him. So as we look here, we can use this and talk about this on a number of different levels. I've preached this passage talking about stewardship. I've preached this passage talking about lean times. I've preached this passage talking about when we're going through seasons where we lack and knowing that God still can make a way. But here, if we understand in the process, we have limitations God expects us to have limitations. In fact, God would prefer us to have limitations because our limitations only set the stage for him to do something special. Walk with me through this text and let me share with you a few things here. The first thing is that as we live with limitations, you got to start with what you have. See, when in the process, everybody they need to take an inventory of your life right now. Think about all the stuff and the reasons that you have said why something could not be. Maybe you said, I can't go because I don't have enough. How many times have you said you can't afford it? How many times have you said you don't know enough? How many times have you talked yourself out of something only because of what you don't have? How many times have you denied yourself possibilities because you were looking at what you did not have while overlooking what you do have? The woman tells the prophet here that she is in distress and like they are going to take my sons because I can't afford to pay this debt. And the prophet said, how can I help you? Sister, tell me, well, tell me what you got in your house. 
And she says, your servant has nothing but just a little bit of oil. Right now, I don't know where you are in your process, but somewhere you are caught in between the next level and your limitations. And you are saying now that because of my limitations, you have placed a ceiling over your potential. Because of your limitations, you have decided that this is the end of the road. This is as far as I can go. This is as high as I can climb. This is the best I'll ever have. This is the most I'll ever be. And it won't be any different from what it is right now. And so let me just sit here and get comfortable because it is what it is. But now you need to hear God say, rather than just settling for where you are, start looking at what you have. Don't worry about what you don't have because God can't hold you accountable for what you don't have. Stewardship is about managing what you do have. And let me tell you something. Everybody's got something. Everybody's got something. You might not have as much as a person sitting next to you. You might not have as much as Earl, but you got what you got. You might not have as much as the president you might not have as much as this person but you do have something and the prophet started this lady on a new journey and he changed her life not by exposing her to something she didn't have he didn't expose her to what she'd never seen but he made her look at what she had on hand and so right now I need everybody to start thinking about what's in your own house Quit looking over the fence, quit flipping through catalogs, quit riding by car lots, quit walking through other people's house, quit coveting other people's stuff, and look at your own house. Look at what you have, look at your account, look in your garage, look in your bedroom, look in your office, look on the other side of the table, look across the room, look right there and see what you have, because what you have is where you will start. But just because you start there, doesn't mean that that's where you finish just because that's where I start doesn't mean that's where I stay but it is where I will start and I just trust that God will get in what I have and God will do something about it because I'm going to commit it unto him when you trust the process you got to walk with God and be able to be very very clear about what you do have can't overlook your meager means after all, if you just, if anybody who's read the Bible any length of time, you ought to know by now that God does not use people who have everything. That God all throughout scripture used folk and they never had enough. They never had enough, but God used them anyhow. He called Abram and made him the father of many nations, but he did not bless him at 25 years of age when he was young and viral and strong. But it wasn't until the man turned 100 years old that he had his first child. And here we got the nerve to tell God what we don't have. But the Lord said, look at what you have. And all Abraham could say was, I ain't got nothing but gray hairs. I ain't got nothing but this old man body but God say it still works use your old man body and see won't I bless you God uses folk who got limitations remember when he talked to Moses from the burning bush and Moses said Lord I can't go down there talking to Pharaoh I got a speech impediment I got a stammering tongue I got a stuttering problem but God said you go anyway you got a brother he can talk just fine if you get in trouble just let your brother do the talking but the message will come from you the Lord uses folk who got limitations. Look at them Hebrew boys. They didn't come from royalty and they denied themselves the king's food. They denied themselves the king's wine. But yet then when they came back and investigated these boys look better. They look stronger. They look healthier and they ate nothing but vegetables and water because God blessed what they had and they trusted God to give them what they did not have on their own. God uses inferior people and God uses inferior stuff. So stop worrying about what you don't have because God might like you just that way. The less you got, the more useful you can be because if you got too much stuff, you get in the way of God. 
You got too much education. You're too smart for your own good. You got too much money. You think you can spend it all on your own. You got too much willpower. You got too much. And then God can't use you as effectively. So here you got to start with what you have. Because when we walk with God, we're walking with the God we know who is infinite in possibility. Always starts with this place of surrender in the process. You're ready for God to take you to another dimension of experience. But you can't go and reach that next plateau until you have totally surrendered where you are currently. It becomes a matter of surrender is, it's, it's, it's that in every sense of the word. It's completely letting go. It is, it is refusing and resisting your own urge to control. In surrender, I am allowing God to do only what he can do. And he will do it without my counsel, without my without me sharing, without me trying to give him information, I'm going to surrender. And then after you start with what you have, here's a part that really messes with me. You got to create capacity. You got to create capacity. Elisha told her to listen. He said, it didn't make any sense. He said, okay, what, what you got in your house? She said, all I have is a little bit of oil. Now, the oil was valuable, but she didn't have nearly enough to settle her debts. She said, all I have is a little bit of oil. That, that not even enough to, to scratch the surface of what I owe. Elijah said, okay, okay, that's fine. So here's what you do. You need to go to everybody's house that you know. And you need to borrow as many empty pots as you can. He didn't say go and get as much oil as you can. Because if she goes and borrows more oil, she's going to owe more people. But he says go and get empty vessels. Because an empty vessel, far as she's concerned, is no good. But he tells her, you need to go and ask to borrow. And he said, and don't ask for a few. Don't ask for a few. She, her concern was not oil. Her concern were the pots. She was not to be concerned about what was going to be on the inside. She just had to make sure that she had enough vessels to contain what would be on the inside. Keep, just, just walk with me. That, that the oil was going to be the thing of value. That that she didn't have. But she did have the, the capacity or she had the resource to go and collect the vessels that would hold the value. So he didn't tell her to go and find the oil. He said, you just go and get the jars. Don't worry about the oil. Just go and get the jars. Now, how many times have you been looking at a situation and only realizing, only thinking about the fact that you need oil to fix the situation? And so because you don't have the oil, you just let the situation stay as it is. But here, this woman could not worry about the oil, but she had to worry about the jars. How many of us now won't work on a situation because we can't see the oil? When the God say, I got all the oil you need, but you ain't got nothing to put the oil in. And so if you ain't got nothing for the oil, then you can't appreciate the oil if I want to give it to you. Y'all come, come a little closer because you still, you're missing me. See, you worried about the oil, but God is saying, I got the oil. You need to be worried about jars. You want oil, but you ain't got nowhere to put oil. 
And so I will be wasting my oil if I'm just going to pour it on your life and you got nothing to catch it with. You got nothing to hold it with. You got nothing to store it in. You got nothing to save it with. And so quit worrying about oil and start looking for jars. Let me help you. Y'all still miss me. Let me tell my jars. Stop worrying about the oil and you go get the jars. Go get the education and God will get the job. You go get yourself ready and God will do what he can do. You go and get yourself together and God will make ends come together. You go and do it. may look crazy to other people. They're like, what are you going with all them jars? Tell them I'm making room because the oil is about to flow. Where is he going with them empty pots? I'm making room for the blessing of God. Think about Noah. Noah was building a ship and they had never seen rain before. And they're like, where is Noah going with all that wood? Don't worry about it. You just keep hammering and putting it together because the Lord made you a promise. Don't worry about the oil. You just get the jars. Somebody now, you need to start your jar collection enterprise. You need to start doing that thing that makes absolutely no sense. But you know it's necessary for what's down the road. It makes no sense why you put money back in this place. But you just tell them I'm putting it back because I know a time will come when I'll need it. Tell them why you going to school for this. Ain't no jobs out there in this world. The Lord told me get the education. Get myself prepared. Get myself ready. So that when the time comes, all I got to do is come with my vessel already prepared and because guess what the oil didn't start flowing until she had an empty pot to put it in God got all the oil in the world God will never run out but will you trust him enough in the process to keep on collecting your empty pots collecting your empty vessels and giving God the space and the room and the capacity to work in your life create the capacity you've got to create the space for God to come in and move I need folk who got empty pot mentality rather than people who got a little oil mentality see when you got that little oil mentality you only trust in what you have but when you got an empty pot mentality you trust it in what God can deliver in fact, in fact, I got an empty pot and people might be looking at me crazy because I ain't got nothing in it. I'll just tell them, well, it ain't my job to fill it. I'm just here with it so that when God is ready for it to flow, I got something to catch it all. And don't look at me. Don't laugh at me because my pot bigger than yours. You know, some folk would go around and get some stuff that can't nobody see. You got little bitty cups that you can hide in your pockets because you don't want nobody to know what you up to. You got people going around knocking on doors. They're going to borrow from somebody, but you're going to ask for a little bitty stuff because you don't want nobody to see it. But I'm going to come with a big old barrel, big 55-gallon drum strapped to my back, dragging another one behind me, getting the biggest thing I can find. I'm finding old Home Depot buckets. I'm finding big buckets. I'm finding whole troughs, feed troughs. I want a manger of blessings. I'm finding everything that I can. I'm turning over every bucket, every stone, every vase, everything. I'm making room because I just believe that if I bring God enough empty vessels, he gonna let the oil keep flowing as long as I got room for his blessing. So now, you in the process. You ask yourself, you making room or are you just looking at what you have? You, you making room because you know more can come. Uh, you just looking at what you got and just want to hold on and preserve that. He tells her, go, go, and don't ask for a few. I know, I know it, it, it sounds unconventional and crazy, but that's why it's God's process. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In fact, he told her, make sure they're empty. Don't miss that. See, see, make sure they're empty. Because sometimes we bring some stuff kind of half full, trying to help God out. 
we, 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 bring, we, we bring, bring already got some stuff in it. But what if what the Lord want to put in there don't match what you already got in it? Don't, don't bring him nothing half full. Don't, don't come with your own assessment. Don't come with your own preconceived ideas. Don't come with your own creativity. engine. Just come empty. Come empty and come unknowing. Come, come, come empty and come willing as a child. And just bring it unto God. And then there's the last thing. And we'll be out of here. But so, 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 so I started with what I got. And I've created capacity. Only thing left is to let God do the filling. That's it. Let God do the filling. Because it's what he told you. He said, now listen, when you get all your pots. You, now, you know, I could talk about the fact in the stewardship that because she had her sons doing it. She said, babies, y'all need to go get all the pots you can. That's the thing. It, it, it ought to be a household enterprise. Right? Let every, don't let your kids, don't, you know, quit trying to protect your children from certain hardships. Don't feel bad. You, your children need to know, no, we ain't going because we can't afford it. No, we're not going to McDonald's. We're going to go home and take this wheat bread and this lunch meat and this ketchup. And these, and these, these generic potato chips, the tater chips, and this water, and we're going to have some fun. We, we, we ain't going to Chuck E. Cheese. We're going to go down here to Myers, get some cupcakes. You're 12 now. I ain't got but 10 candles. Figure it out. You know how old you are? This is how it is. But, but, but he, he, he tells her, get your boys together, close the door. Close the windows. This ain't to be shared with nobody. When, you, when you're in your process, let the process be between you and God. Because see, cause everybody can't appreciate your process. And some folk, if you're not careful, will infiltrate and influence and ultimately they will, they will compromise your process. Some folk may contaminate your process. And yet he, he, he tells her then, and so then you start with the oil you got. And I want you to take that one and just start filling, filling the, filling the, filling the jars. Start with what you got. You've created p- capacity. And guess what? He, 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 he didn't bring in oil from somewhere else. She started with that little bit of oil that she had. She had to start pouring that one. And when she started pouring it, the oil started flowing. She told her baby, here, put this bucket right here. And she took the top off. And the baby was like, that's all the oil we got, mama. She started pouring and they watched the oil go into the bucket in the capacity that she had created and the oil started flowing and they noticed that there was more oil in the new bucket than it was in the old bucket and they saw that the oil kept rising but the oil also kept flowing it looked like it was about to overflow she said baby bring me another bucket and they quickly switched out the buckets and she kept on pouring and the oil kept on flowing. By now they know we got more oil now than we had and what we started. There was some kind of connection between the God of the oil and the woman of the capacity. That she had to keep bringing and making capacity. And as long as she had capacity, God had oil to flow. Her responsibility was not to fill. Her responsibility was to make room. So I don't know who I'm preaching to right now. But make sure that you got plenty empty vessels. Because the Lord is ready to stop making oil flow. God is ready to stop blessing somebody. God is ready to start allowing the oil to flow in your life. But you are stopping up the oil. You're stopping up the flow because you will not make room. But as long as you got something that God invest in, you got opportunity for God to work in your life. I don't know where you are on your journey. I don't know where you are in your process. But quit looking at your little bit 
and just start making room for more. I don't know what you need, but God's got it all. He's got the cattle on a thousand hills. God is the source of my strength. God is my refuge. God is my strong tower. God is my will in the middle of a will. God is my food on my table. God is my health when I'm hungry. God is everything that I need. So where are you in your process? Are you going to let God do the filling? Are you going to let God pour into you? Are you going to give God your empty heart? Are you going to give him your empty life? Are you going to surrender yourself to him and allow him to bless you beyond measure? Don't worry about where it's coming from. He can afford it. Don't worry about whether you're worthy or not. You just keep making room because I'll help you with it. You don't deserve it, but the Lord got enough grace to go around. Don't worry about what other folks say. Just tell them you got some for you too. Just make some some room don't worry about if you think you should have it it's not a matter of deserving it's called grace and I want the Lord to give me as much as he wants me to have so if all I got to do is create space then I'm gonna keep on making room I'm gonna make room for stuff I've never seen before I'll make room for blessings I didn't know were possible I'll make room for opportunities that I never could have dreamt for myself but when you're walking with God it's all about doing and allowing God to do through you what you cannot do on your own when you walk with God God will use you in ways you've never been used before when you walk with God God will forgive you of all of your sin and all your trespasses God can take you out of the drug house take you out of the jail house take you out of the crack house God would take you out of somebody else's house use you in his house and make you his man make you his woman God would take your little bit and make it a lot God will stretch your little bit and make it go a long way because that's the kind of God that he is I'm looking at folk in here and you sitting in places you ought not be sitting. I'm looking at people, you driving cars you shouldn't be driving. Living in houses you shouldn't be living in. Married to folk you know you shouldn't be married to. Doing things you know that you are not capable of doing. But all you did was you gave God room to work in your life. And I'm telling you that the oil can still flow. If you're willing to go round up some pots, round up some vessels, and what does vessel round up ministry look like? It just means that you got to go out there, you got to keep on grinding, you got to keep on praying, you got to keep on praising, you got to keep on serving, you got to keep on loving, you got to keep on trusting, you got to keep on walking, you got to keep on loving, you got to keep on serving, you got to keep on trusting, you got to keep on walking with God, you got to keep on loving, you got to keep on serving, you got to keep on trusting you got to keep on walking with God you got to keep on loving you got to keep on serving you got to keep on trusting you got to keep on walking with God I'm gonna keep on preaching until somebody catches it you got to keep on walking you got to keep on loving you got to keep on serving you got to keep on trusting God make room for God make room for his blessing make room for God I know you don't feel like it but when you don't feel like it you got to sing even harder you got to pray even even harder I'm gonna preach even harder because some days I don't feel like it but I'm gonna keep on loving I'm gonna keep on serving I'm gonna keep on trusting I'm gonna keep on preaching I'm gonna keep on believing I'm gonna keep on walking with God because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength because I know that I'm more than a conqueror and I can do anything but fail no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper the Lord is my shepherd I shall not be in want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside quiet waters he restores my soul for his name's sake and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I fear no evil thy rod and thy staff they comfort me hey Hey! Trust the process. Trust the process. Your limits, 
Your limits only create opportunities for God to do what only God can do. Therefore, don't feel bad about your limitations. Your limitations do not make you less than. Your limitations do not have to put a ceiling on your dreams. Your limitations are not caps for your potential. But rather your limitations are be gateways for God's supernatural favor in your life. That your limitations ought to be a new platform for a new realm of experience. I don't know this stuff. I don't know how this stuff works out. It's not for me to know. Seminary don't teach us what it took for the oil to keep flowing. I just know that God was on the other side. Seminary didn't give us a plausible explanation of why the oil stopped when she ran out of jars. I just believe that the Lord stopped because she had nowhere else to put what more he wanted to give. Which means it tells me that if she had more jars, God would still be pouring. That means then that God don't place limits on how he want to bless you. God doesn't limit us, we limit ourselves. So I don't know about you, but I'm going to keep on finding as many empty things as I can. When I run out of big stuff, I'm going to get the little stuff. I'm going to find empty thimbles and let them fill them up too. I'm going to find old bottle caps and let them fill them up. I'm going to find old cups and let them fill them up. I'm going to find shoes and let them fill them up. You know, shoes can hold some stuff too. I'm going to find all kind of stuff. I know y'all using old butter bowls as your dishes in your house. I'm going to use that too. I'm going to know all, I'm going to use old egg, egg cartons. I'm going to have a dozen size blessings, 18 blessings, compartmentalized. You look cute little blessings because the Lord had filled up all of my empty spaces with his glory and his goodness. Let's thank God. Let's thank God. So, so that means then that, that I now I've got to take, I've got to do some investigating of where I am in my process. I've got to, I've got to come to grips with the fact that this belongs to God. That God has already determined what the process will look like. And just as sure as he knows what the process will look like, then I've got to, as I'm going to be trusting in the process, I've got to trust that there'll be places in this thing where it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's okay. There'll be periods in the process where I'll be lonely. There'll be hardship in the process. Realize that I don't appreciate it as much if it's just handed to me easy. In fact, some stuff you just got to, you got to earn. Got to work for. Got to work for. And you know, there's some blessings in the process. You can't get them until you have gone through some stuff. Don't despise the journey. Some journeys are rougher than others, but you wouldn't be who you are were it not for your journey. Don't let nobody look down on you because you, you took the long way. Because in the process, sometimes God chooses the wrong way for us, or the long way that matter. Because see, the long way doesn't have to be the wrong way if it's God's way. And in this, every one of us find ourselves wrestling with our limitations. Feeling like because this is all I have, perhaps there can be no more for me. But this widow's testimony here tells me, all I got to do is just make more room. God can go, God can go beyond Paul tells us, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. I don't know about y'all, but I think I'm going to believe that. I'm going to rest in that. I've got a very vivid imagination. I can, I can dream up the kind of blessings I want. I 
can. But God's got an imagination superior to that. He can do for me beyond what I could imagine. There may be somebody here this morning and this message is for you because the message is an invitation. It's an invitation for you to trust God on your journey. Maybe there's somebody here and you're saying, I just wish I could have a whole nother life. I wish I could get a do-over. In golf, we call it a mulligan. You hit a bad shot, you shank one in the trees. Hit one in the water. Mulligan is kind of like a golfer's grace. You get a do-over. Guess what? God's got a do-over for you. It's under one condition, though. He'd rather that you let him do it this time rather than you do it yourself. Maybe somebody here right now and you're ready to start your process. The process begins by accepting Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away and behold, all things become new. You can start your new life today. Start your process. All you have to do is just get up from wherever you are. Lift your hand. Maybe you're here and you're saying, I'm, I'm walking with God. I'm in my process, but I'm not connected to a local church. You can't do the Christian life in isolation. God bless you. Every believer needs to be connected to a local church. God bless you. Every believer must be connected to a local church. You're here. God bless you. You're saved. But you can't grow and prosper on your own. God did not design Christians to be self-sufficient beings. But God created us to be communal people. And so you need the church. But not only do you need the church, but this church needs you. You've got special skills and gifts, passion. That resonate with us, that fill voids that we have, make us better. Why don't you come and be a part of our family? Help us be a better church. I tell you right now, we, we don't have enough. You've heard it from the pastor. Some folk out there think that we got enough. We don't need anybody else. Don't listen to that. They just don't want nobody else. We need people. As long as there's days on earth and there are people on earth, there's still people who need Jesus. The world needs Jesus. Therefore, God's army needs soldiers. So we do both. We train. We train. We train soldiers. But we also save. If you're here this morning, we'd love to be your church family. God bless you. Somebody else may be thinking about this. Don't, be, don't, be assume, don't make assumptions now that nobody's going to come because there's just not that many people here. Or Don't worry about that. You don't know who's here. And you don't know what the Spirit is doing in somebody's heart. And so right now we ought to all be praying for that soul that's hanging in the balance. For that individual who's in their seat still, whose heart is saying, I need this. With their mind is saying it's not the right time. Their heart is saying, I don't have this, but I want it. But their mind is saying, what does this mean? Be praying that this person's body can follow their heart. Because we're praying for you. Don't worry about what other folk may think. Because can nobody in here save you. And nobody in here can keep you. So nobody in here is worth you losing your destiny why don't you come right now quit worrying about what this means what you could lose because i promise you you can't lose making this decision all you can do is gain all you can do is gain if you're here if you don't want to get up but you know this is for you you make your way on the other side of this wall you can be received in the same way right over there there's a room 
We're going to counsel with you in private. Nobody's going to make you give a speech. You don't have to tell us or justify why you come and why you're worthy, all that. It's none of our business. Getting up doesn't make you a bad person. All you're saying is, this is what I want. This is what I need. I'm surrendering. I'm starting my process. Amen. Let's thank God today for his word and these blessings. Let's be praying for these individuals who have responded to the appeal, responded to the word. Let's be praying for them. And now let's prepare ourselves as we go to the table. We partake in the Lord's Supper. If you're seated over here in this overflow, would you please make your way into the main floor? Our deacons are coming as we prepare now for worship at the table. Please make room for the worshipers coming over. Amen. Amen.